All right, so this is part three or part four, it's tough to count, of the continuing education lectures. What we're doing now is we're doing the stacking problems. We have a bunch of dominoes. Now, there's slight asymmetries because these are actually from a game, so there is not a uniform distribution of weight, but you know, we will pretend that these are idealized dominoes that are perfectly uniform in terms of their density. And the question is, what is the maximum overhang we can make? It's very important to realize what is being asked in the problem and what are you implicitly assuming is part of the problem but is not there. So uh, one example you know, people might have seen is there's the nine dot problem. You know, if any of these dominoes are chipped, of course, that will come out of <laughs> your school budget. You know, these dominoes have been in my family for almost five years. <laughs> so the goal is to draw a line through these nine points. Hopefully it's safe to do that. So the goal is to draw three lines that go through all nine points, but you can't take your pen off the paper or you can't take your marker off the board. And so you know, a lot of people go, well, I could go like this, and I could come back like this, and I could go like this, but I, I missed the two points. Or I could try maybe just come like this, come like this. And, you know. So all the different ways you look at it, it doesn't seem like there's a way to get through all nine points with just three lines. You know, if you could take your pen off the board, you go boom, 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 not so bad. <coughs> I've never said these are three mathematical points. I said these are three points on the board. They have a thickness. So if you draw at a very appropriate angle, you know, so you hit this point mm -hmm. at the extreme left and this point at the extreme right, then you come down and do mm -hmm. the same thing like this, mm -hmm. and then you come down you know, not to scale. <laughs> so you're saying there's a million times that there's no kid that this point on the page on the board right here that has no width. <laughs> this is the one time where it does have width. And so it's very natural to read things into a problem that aren't there. So most of the time when people first look at this problem, and I'm asking you, what's the maximum overhang? The thought is each domino must be on top of the previous and must be migrating, moving, whatever, in the direction you want to have the overhang. Mm. But the problem never says you have to move in just one direction. Mm -hmm. So sometimes, um, I don't think anybody has done this pattern, but this is also another really popular one. something like this. Technically, just one domino on top would be enough, but if you have five, you maybe put two over here to put some more weight, and you can have almost one whole overhang like this. I see other designs, you know, hey, that's a really nice one. Um, you know, where you've got your know, two dominoes weighting another one down to help you really push one up. But you can, you can go in both directions. You can go back and forth. So we've got one here going a little bit backwards and forwards. You're trying to use the different weights. So my math professor freshman year is actually one of the people who has found the optimal way or approximately the optimal way of doing this. And this is very similar to the Babylonian math we saw earlier, where you know, how do we multiply x times y? Good way is x plus y squared minus x squared minus y squared over four. It's sometimes better to take one step backwards to then take two steps forward. Then it's sometimes better to be building in two different directions. And so what I'll do is, I'm gonna make the assumption that you have everybody's email addresses. So I will eventually send Jill some stuff to share on just some papers on domino stacking. Let's make the problem <coughs> a little bit easier. Uh, there is a reason why he was a professor at Yale when I arrived. There's a reason he's working at Microsoft Research. He's extremely smart. I do not wanna go through all the details of what he's been doing. I wanna instead do the simpler problem of uh, unidirectional Stacking. So we will make the assumption that you can only stack the dominoes in one direction. And then the question will be, what is the maximum overhang we can do? Hopefully this will be related to calculus, as that's the reason we're here. Uh, there have been a couple of topics I were told were you know, must have in terms of what's covered. And so this problem actually involves a huge number of them. 
And then depending on how things go, we can either do more you know, pure theoretical stuff or we can do another game type problem that can be incorporated into the classroom. All right, so let's proceed by induction. So base case, one domino. Is there an E at the end? No, no E, okay. Only when it's plural. All right. No. So if you have one domino, what is the maximum? Okay. There's really nothing we can do. The domino is just there. <laughs> okay. So do we agree that this case is fully analyzed? All right. Now let's say we have two dominoes. So the first one has to go on the ground. And then the second one, I'm going to do things relative to the center, is placed at some distance from the center. If you place it more than half of the way from the center, what will happen? Mm -hmm. And by symmetry, the on the other side will fall. The only possibility is either at the center or actually pushing it in even further to be secure. So in principle, if you put it right at the center, or just a little bit before that, infinitesimally before, you should be okay. So I don't think it's too bad to see that in the case of two dominoes, you want to start off right at the center. This is where things become a little bit painful, and I'm deliberately not preparing the lecture well, so that you can choose things. What is the length of the domino? One domino. <laughs> so, how many units are there in one domino? <clears throat> I like to measure things in one, so it's one unit long. So units matter. Uh, I think my favorite unit is the Millie Helen from Isaac Asimov. The what? The Millie Helen. It's enough beauty to launch one ship. Uh. <laughs> why, do you, why do you want to have the domino be one unit long? But do we agree that the natural point is the center of the domino? Yes. Well, that, I mean, that's only based on my experience. Like, you know, really, like, like, I don't know what physics that looks like. Like, it might be another point that's not as far away, but I... Right, so, but, so it's a, we might actually go back and forth in terms of changing. I think that the two natural lengths of the domino is either one unit or two units. That it might be natural because if we make it two units, and this is one unit, and we're talking about how much of that one are we shifting over. What's actually nice is because these are from a game, they've got a black line on it. So it's almost telling me, call me two units. <laughs> so I, I do have an idea as to which is the better unit to use, one or two. You want to go to two? So it makes math. Have you seen this problem? No, but I'm envisioning where it's going. You're envisioning where it's going. So. Let's do a friendly amendment and change it to a two unit length domino. So these are two units. Now the other thing we have to determine is where do we want the origin to be? Well, if we're talking about everything from the center, why is our origin at the center? Maybe it is the center. So I'm saying, you know, it's your choice. Right? You can choose the origin to be wherever you want. I think the center is a very natural point to choose. The other point would be the extreme left. Mm -hmm. The other point would be the extreme right. Those are the three natural candidates. And so one of the things when you're talking to students is how do you choose where you orient things? How do you choose where you normalize things? If you make the right choice, it makes the algebra easier. And so sometimes you want to think a little bit before you really get into the problem. So I call Henry David Thoreau the patron saint of mathematics. If there's great advice, simplify, simplify. If you choose the algebra properly, there will be dividends later. So you might make provisional choices. Let's provisionally choose the domino to have two units. Let's provisionally choose the origin to be at the center of the domino on the bottom. And then in this case, the best we can do with two dominoes would be like this. And so the question is, what is the overhang here? One unit. So it's one unit. 
So this is one unit. What's the distance from the center? Uh, I'm sorry, where we place the first domino, or where we place the second domino? What's the distance from the center? Zero. Yeah. So it's zero. Mm -hmm. So I think it might actually be easier to put the origin over here. <coughs> and then the distance that the first domino is placed is going to now be one unit. So this is the top domino. So this would be domino one, domino two. So we place the top domino one unit from the bottom left of domino two. Um, oh, where the edge is? Well, no, I'm just saying this is my first domino and this is my second one. I'm, I'm, I'm starting my numbering from the top. Because basically, if I have something that works, I can pick this whole thing up in the ear and then place it on the new domino. Yeah. I'm not going to take, this is a good question, I'm not going to take something that works and place something on it like this. Yeah. This is stable. So because it's stable, or I guess I'm just doing two, because these two are stable, I can pick this up and then I can say, how should I place this so now I have three dominoes? I could place it over here and it's fine, and then I see what's the maximum I can move it over. Sequence. Sequence up. I wouldn't take this and place something over here and see how far I could move it back. So I'm going to be building, I'm actually building downward. So there's an enormous amount in this problem in terms of just trying to determine what order you do things and where you want to be doing things from. So now, why is this stable? Why is it stable to place one domino halfway down the other? Center of gravity. Yeah, the center of gravity is right over the edge of domino two. So in this case, so either the center of mass or the center of gravity. So if you have a bunch of dominoes, the only way the dominoes will not collapse is if every set has its center of mass supported by the domino underneath. So we're trying to figure out how to stack the dominoes. We've decided we're going to make the dominoes two units long, and we've decided we're going to make the origin at the extreme left of the bottom domino. And we're going to be counting from the top, because if we have something that's stable, we'll then pick that up and put that on something new. So the next level is actually building downward. OK, so now we've known <coughs> how far we shift things. The first domino is shifted by one unit. Now we want to figure out what do we do with three dominoes. So we have three dominoes. So one. And then we've got to figure out where do we want to have the next one. So here's zero, here's two. So do we agree that these two dominoes need to be placed exactly in this configuration? Because if we move this domino any further, we're in trouble. Now, unfortunately, what might happen is maybe it would be better to shift this one a little bit to move in the center mass of this whole block. I'm not going to worry about that now. Let's just consider, let's say we're going to just keep building what we've done before. So the question is, how far do we want to push these? So for these, for this one, the center of mass of this is right over here. So it's supported. This one is supported by this one. For these two, this center of mass needs to be supported and me on this. Where is the best place for that center of mass to be? Well, on this, on the bottom block, where do I want the center of mass of these two to be on the bottom block? On the edge. On the edge. So I want the center of mass of those two to be on the edge. So 
So we know that this is one unit here. We have some shift over here that we don't know. And we need to figure out where is the center of mass. Well, this whole block is equivalent to having all of its mass over here. This whole block is equivalent to having its mass here. So the two of them have a mass of two that will be three fourths, right? So we have a mass of two at, well, let's call this x. So what do we want x to be? Oh, no, one fourth. Or a fourth of two. You gotta do well, three fourths of two. Make sure we get things right. Um, three fourths of two then. No, wait, wait, I don't think this is right. So if this is x, let, 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 let's do this really slowly because I think I've just made a small algebra mistake. So the first block is shifted over one plus x. So it's one plus x, and then its center of mass is halfway down. No, but it's, it's one, half of the domino is one. Oh, half the domino is one, yes, thank you. Thank you, yes. So we've made the domino by the two, yes. So this is the location of the center of mass for the first domino. And its mass is just one. The second domino, its center of mass is at x plus one. And it also has a mass. And then I divide by two. And so I'll get x plus one I get it twice plus a half. And that's the location of the center of mass of these two blocks. What does x plus one plus one half have to equal? Two. Two, because that's where we want the center of mass to be. We want this to equal two. So that tells us that x has to equal a half. It should balance. So a half is a quarter. So a half is a quarter of the domino. I don't think it really works. It works. It's an homage. So I'm trying to cheat by doing it on an inclined plane. <laughs> Practice, you have to shift things down a little bit. But is the, the first one's, no, it's x plus one, right? The first one is x plus one. And then we have to go down, the dominoes have length two, so its center of mass will be here. So maybe I'm slower thinking. So, so, so I the, come over a quarter the, of one the, domino. The, 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 yeah. the, right, the, the first one goes over a quarter. The next one goes, goes over, over half. Which is at about the three quarters mark. And so it should look something like this. Goes over. Think of your center of mass. Yeah. That's three halves ah. divided. Like the landing on the second step is twice as long as the first step. Right. <laughs> so we'll, we'll, we'll do the three domino calculation now. And then I think if we just hopefully do one more, then we can generalize this to just half of it. So now. 
So now let's try to figure it out. So we know this distance here is one. And this distance here is one half. Mm -hmm. And now we need to figure out this distance here, I'll call it y. And so I have heard a conjecture of one third. Why not one fourth? One, one half, one fourth, one eighth. That means half of the area and then half of the area. Ah. <coughs> so I, I think one third and one fourth are the two natural candidates. Mm -hmm. If we do the algebra correctly, we will get one third. So the question is, what's the fastest way to do the algebra? What we could say is the center of mass of this one is going to be y plus a half plus one plus one, right? And then the center mass of this is gonna be y plus a half plus one. And the center mass of this is just gonna be y plus one. And then we divide <coughs> by three. And so everything has a y plus one. We get y plus one, we had three times. And now here, we have a half, we have a, a half, and we have a one. So one half plus one half is one, plus one is two, plus two thirds. So if I've done the algebra correctly, we should get y plus one plus two thirds. And what must this equal? Three. Not three. Where does the center of mass have to be for these three blocks? A two. two. So it's got to be here again. So y plus one plus two thirds has to equal two. Right. So we get y equals one third. <coughs> and so the claim is correct. The shift over is one third. The next one will be one fourth and one fifth and one sixth. The question is, is there a fast way to do the algebra to kind of formalize this and see if we know it's going like this, then the next one will be one fourth and one fifth, one sixth. So I could have these algebra expressions. This was one half plus one plus one. This was one half plus one. This was just plus one. And so if you look at what I'm dropping, maybe a better way to write this is this is one plus a half. This is just a half, only that's zero. So you can begin to see the harmonics here. So the next level should be y, oh, I guess it's z now, z plus one plus a half plus a third plus one plus z plus one plus a half plus one plus z plus uh, one plus one plus, so let's go right to the thing. So we have here, we have the one third, come down to just one half, come down to just one, and then just down to z plus one. So here we have one plus a half plus y. Then we had one half. Well, that's one fifth. So hopefully this is right. But this is showing you why we don't want to do the algebra this way. Because then we have to work with this. And it's actually, I think, good to show the students a thing for algebra and say, don't you appreciate a better way around this and trying to figure out, do I have things in the right place? We want to figure out where is the center of mass if we add one more brick, given that we know where the center of mass was before. Okay, so let's try to do the calculation. So, when we do these ones over here, we know its center of mass is going to be right here. 
I mean, what's the mass that's equivalent to that? How much mass do we have here? Two. 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 So if we look at the more general case, Let's say over here, this is n. Um, it's always annoying us to really want to have your plus one and your minus one. Mm -hmm. So let's say we have n domino here. And then we have one domino here. So if we look at all of these ones, the first n minus one <coughs> have their center of mass here. Right? Mm -hmm. And so we can assume that the mass of these n minus 1 is equivalent to putting a mass of size n minus 1 here. Right? It's equivalent to just collapsing these n minus 1 dominoes and putting a mass of size n minus 1 right here. This domino is equivalent to having all of its mass here, which is a mass of size 1. And so, because this whole domino is of length 2, what's this distance? Not n. It's 1. The whole domino has length 1. These n minus 1, it's like all their mass is at the upper right corner. Oh, sorry, the whole domino has length 2. The whole domino has length 2. The n minus 1 is like all their mass is right here. The mass of this domino is right at its center, and the center would be one unit from the edge. So really, when you look at the weight on the final domino, so here's the final domino, here's zero, here's two, and we have some shift. <coughs> Let's call you know, our shift S. So we have a mass of size 1 at a distance of s plus 1. And we have a mass of size n minus 1 at s plus 1 plus 1, also known as s plus 2. Because these ones are two units past s. This one is one unit past s. So we want the center of mass, I should probably draw this so it's outside. We want the center of mass to equal two. So we want one, the mass of this block, times s plus one, plus n minus one, because we have n minus one at a distance of s plus 1 plus 1 should equal 2. And we have to divide this by by n, because we have n blocks. Right? So that will give us the formula for the center of mass. We made some assumptions, you know, we simplified things, and we could say, well, look, the first n minus 1 is like they're all over here. We really have n objects that we're averaging. So we add up all their distances, and we just get this distance n minus 1 times, and then divide by n. So now we just have to do some algebra. So we have s plus, we have 1, s plus 1, we have n minus 1, s plus 1s. All right, so that's going to just give us an s plus 1. And we're left with an n minus 1 over n times 1. n minus 1 over n is just 1 minus 1 over n. We have two here, we have two there, we move the negative one over to the other side, and we get s equals one over n after some algebra. So this gives us how much we should shift over. And so if you have n plus one dominoes, so we get one plus one half plus one third plus one over n. 
So the only thing that we have to potentially worry about is, could we have done better by maybe shifting this one back a little bit and then trying to move that whole thing further? Would that have helped us? I'm sorry? is one plus one half, yes. If you did less than that, couldn't you just go to the max over and go one plus one half plus one over? Right, so the, so the idea is... But that's like if you did less than one and a half for the second value of less than a half, can you make up that? Exa up exactly, the exactly. See, because this is now a little bit more stable, maybe this whole thing can be slid down more. Yeah, yeah, the question is, is the maximum that we could do just what you just said enough? I, I believe this is the maximum. The only thing you have to be careful about is you have to rule out the possibility that maybe it's better to shift the first domino back a little bit to have something that's a little bit more stable that you can then shift the whole thing forward. But I guess my question is that even if you do shift it back and it's maximum enough that you shift it back, you can't shift any more forward. Right, because then, because then you're losing that exactly, because you're then pushing it in the opposite direction from where you want it to go. So you could have let the domino shift it forward, but you couldn't shift any more forward than you did. Right, and so I think you can say that this is the best you can do if you only want to go linearly in one direction. That you're not going to get any gain <coughs> if you don't shift it as far as possible. And so the question is. How rapidly does this series grow? And then I'll send you a link to the optimal domino configuration. The, the pictures are breathtaking in terms of the patterns they come up with. I deliberately don't want to show that so that you can have some fun trying to think. You know, if you have kids, go home and play with them and see if you expand in both directions. What can you do? And then I'll, I'll send the pictures. You can get something that's much, much better than this. But it's almost seeming like today has a theme about trying to understand you know, orders of functions. So here's my question. Approximately how large is this sum? Very big. Very big. Well, let's be explicit. Does the sum diverge? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So can you prove it diverges? Yes. How do you prove it diverges? By proving the terms of the geometric series. Uh, which geometric series? Like if you want to compare it to, you know, you want to be compared to group the terms so that they're all bigger than, I think, one half? Yes, excellent. So that's not geometric. You're adding a half. You're adding a half so every single time. Yeah. So what you do is the following. You have one plus a half plus a third plus a fourth plus a fifth. Because I know where this is going, I'm going to write it plus an eighth plus a ninth plus a sixteenth plus a seventeenth. And now, you've, we've already done grouping earlier today, let's do some more grouping. <coughs> let's group one third plus a fourth. Let's group a fifth to an eighth. Let's group a ninth to a sixteenth. So this is greater than or equal to one plus a half plus, and then here, if I replace a third with a fourth, I make things smaller. The next one, I replace everything with one eighth, I only make things smaller. And so what you see is this is equal to one plus a half plus two fourths plus four eighths plus eight sixteenths. And since each one of those is a half, this is just equal to infinity. So this is the simplest way to prove that it's infinity by grouping. I think there's another way. Um, maybe. I think there's a. I think there's another way to prove that it's infinity. If you want, I can quickly try to see if I can do it. 50-50 chance of working. Sure. Right. Are people happy with this proof? I love it. So I'm going to try to work with infinities, all right? So let's assume you know, S equals one plus one half plus one third 
is finite. Then I can write S as one plus a third plus a fifth plus a seventh. And put all the odds here. And then I can collect all the evens. Right? So I would have one half plus one fourth plus one sixth plus one eighth. Well, because they're all evens, I can pull out a two from that. So I get S equals one plus a third plus dot 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 plus one half, one plus a half plus a third plus dot 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 dot. What is this sum equal? The original sum S. So I get S equals one plus a third plus one half S. So if I subtract, I get one half s equals one plus a third so so can I get a contradiction from this? We know s is the sum of 1 plus a half plus a third plus a fourth. Can the top sum like be equal? I'm sorry? Can the instead of like this one? two cut sum not be equal? Well, so, that, so that's a good observation. So if this is equal to a half s, yeah, then, then this would have to be equal to a half s. Right, because the first two are bigger. So this is definitely, I mean, one beats a half, a third beats a fourth, a fifth beats a sixth. Yeah. So if this whole sum converges, this has to be greater mm -hmm. than that. Mm -hmm. So this would be strictly less than twice one plus a third plus a fifth. Because I'm replacing a half with one, I'm replacing a fourth with a third, I'm replacing a sixth with a fifth. Mm -hmm. So then that gives us that if s is, equal, is less than two times this, we get one half s is less than one plus a third plus a fifth. But we just said one half s equals one plus a half, or so one plus a third plus a fifth. So we have a half s is both equal to that and less than that. Contradiction. What was the only assumption we made? The assumption we made was that the sum is finite. And if the sum is finite, it's all positive terms, we can just conclude. So the sum must be infinite because we're led to a contradiction by assuming that the sum is finite. Of the two proofs, I think the grouping is much easier to work with, and you can see what's going on. The so if the sum is, since the sum is infinite, you can't prove them, you can't group them? Well, be, be, I mean, That's because, because of, I don't get. yeah, okay. well, be, because of infinite, this is actually infinite and this is infinite. So they can both, in some sense, equal the same value. Okay. It's infinity plus infinity. If the whole sum was finite, then just the sum of the evens is finite, and just the sum of the odds is finite. Mm -hmm. And then since this beats a term by term, right. and okay. they're finite, then well, look, if I always have, if every day I mm -hmm. add more money to my account than Lily's account, sorry, then mm -hmm. at the end of the year, I'm going to have more money in my account than Lily's account. Right. I There's no way she can live properly. Right. I don't get why you can't prove it. But that's, I well, if they're infinite, right. if they're infinite, you can. So here's the thing, um, <laughs> if they both blow up to infinity, then they could be the same. So for instance, if I always have, if I'm less than you, as time passes, my distance between myself and you could get smaller and smaller and smaller. But any finite moment in time, oh, okay. I'm less than you. 
okay. but in the limit which we never reach. Got so it. there's the Zeno's paradox, you know, I want to walk, I first walk half the way, mm -hmm. and then I walk another half, and then another half, and then another half mm -hmm. of what's left over. So you take a step of size one initially, then one half, one fourth, mm -hmm. one eighth, one sixteenth. At no point in time do you ever walk to the other end. Mm -hmm. But the distance you have is getting smaller and smaller and smaller. Okay, that makes sense. Yep, no problem. So we know that this series diverges. What's nice is we can get some upper and lower bounds as to how quickly it diverges. So we want to understand the size of this because that's going to tell us what kind of overhang we can have. You know, let's say you are you know, building a bridge and you want to build a bridge like this. You want to see how much material do you need to get a certain length? How expensive is it going to be? What kind of bridge should you put in? We could also get, this is a lower bound, we could get an upper bound by replacing the one third with one half. And so if we want the other way, um, this would be less than um, one plus a half plus a half plus then the next one would be the one fourth and one fifth would be one fourth plus one fourth. And then the next one, we now would have one eighth to one fifteenth. So if we do it like this, this gives us an upper bound. And so what we could do is we could take the sum up to a certain point and get upper and lower bounds. So in particular, one plus a half plus a third plus a fourth. And then when we were looking at this, we wanted to stop at a perfect power of two plus one over two to the n. This was greater than one plus a half, plus a half, plus a half, plus a half. I'm not going to bother doing the upper bound. There's a limit to how much algebra you want to see, and I know I'm very close to it. You can argue for the upper bound very similarly. But let's do the lower bound, and I'm going to choose a nice place to stop. So the one thing I have to be careful about is how many twos do I have? How many one halves do I have? Uh, so what I always like to do for problems like this is look at a special case. This 4 is 2 squared. This 8 is 2 cubed. So I stopped at 2 cubed. I had a half three times. So if I go to 2 to the n, how many times should I have a half? Seven. N times. So th this should be n times. So we get 1 plus a half plus a third plus one over two to the n should be greater than one plus n over two. Wow. So if you want to look at things that, you know, what's really going on, this n over two is really the log of two to the n base two. So this is really one plus one half the log base 2 of 2 to the n. So what you might guess is if I did 1 plus 1 half plus a third plus going all the way up to 1 over n, that should be here of the order, you know, 1 plus maybe 1 half log base 2 of n. That this is suggesting that the growth rate of this is like a logarithm. And then I may have this constant wrong, I may have this constant slightly wrong, because this is a lower bound. But I shouldn't be off by too much, because my upper bound is basically just shifting things by an extra half. So my error should be on the order of a half, which is not bad. So a natural point to go from here is the integral test. How many of you have done the integral test in calculus? So we can do the integral test and use that to estimate this. Would that be a worthwhile thing to do? Or do you know the integral test so well that it's not worth doing? No, I just didn't. I assumed the integral Okay. So is it worth doing the integral test and doing some integration? Yes. Okay. Can, can I, I'm sorry. Yep. I, this was, I have a question about, I'm back to the red blank. Maybe you just explain this to me. Sure. I, I need to hear it. Sure. So. So what we're doing is Back, we're 
I understand what you did. Okay. I'm trying to make sense of, do you remember back on page two of my notes? <laughs> <laughs> like it was earlier this morning. Yes. And Houdini's theorem. Yes. Tell me if I got this right. That if the sum of uh, the absolute value is finite, then you can yes. switch around the order. But this isn't finite. So what we, sh what we should really be doing is we should be doing this at a finite level and getting a lower bound for the finite level and then taking the limit as you add more and more terms. So, so, if you so want, that's kind of a, not a, it's a sort of a. Well, what you, what you could do is you could stop at one over two to a perfect power, mm -hmm. one over two cubed, two to the fourth, two to the fifth, and then you would get a lower bound. And then you would see that the more terms you add, your lower bound is growing. And every time you add another full cycle of powers of two, you get another half. Mm -hmm. So basically, every time you double the number of terms you look at, you increase by approximately a half. This is a terrible rate of return. But it's a positive rate of return, and it's always a size a half. So if you just keep iterating this enough times, you can make your sum as large as you want it to be. So what you can do is you can say, look, let me show that the sum can get larger than any finite number. If I take sufficiently many terms, I can make sure I have a half enough times. If I want to be at least 50, I want to have a half 100 times. So if I go all the way up to 1 over 2 to the 100, then I would get 1 plus a half plus a half plus a half plus a half plus a half, and I would have that plus a half 100 times. And so I would get that this equals 51. So you're kind of dodging this Houdini theorem. Well, Houdini is to interchange. I'm not interchanging anything. What I'm saying is, I'm doing a running sum, and as I go along, I'm replacing every two terms. Yeah, I, 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 yep. know, I know what you're doing, I'm just trying to square it with you. Right. Okay. So I'm just trying to get a lower bound. Okay. And so the key thing here is to get a sense of the dependence. So. Let's, let's, let's do the integral test from calculus. We haven't done any integration today. Right. And then probably we'll end, because it's getting late, with the egg drop problem. So. Here's our function f of x. <coughs> so our function is going to be non-increasing. You could also do this for a function that's non-decreasing. And so the reason I want to do a non-increasing is I want to look at 1 plus a half plus a third plus 1 over n. So this suggests, let me study the function 1 over x. And so if I look at the sum, um, m goes from 1 to n of 1 over m. This is going to be 1 plus a half plus a third plus 1 over m. And I want to approximate the sum with an integral. And so if I look at this, so here's 1, here's 2, here's 3, here's 4 dot, 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 here's n minus 1, and here's n. So what's nice is because this function is strictly decreasing, if I do calculus, uh, these are the Riemann sums, you have your upper sum and your lower sum. The upper sum is always usually in the place where the function is largest. Well, for me, that's going to be the left end point. So here for the first box, it would go like that. And the next box would go like this, and the next box would go like this. And that would give us an upper bound. And so if I want an upper bound for this sum, this would be less than or equal to the integral from one, and then we've got to be careful, because we're including uh, the last term is one over n, we've really got to go all the way up to one over n plus one. 
because you know here we have that last little extra block over there. So it would be integrating from one to n plus one of one over x dx. And that would be an upper bound for the sum. If I want to get a lower bound, well, I would just take my blocks like this. And then for the last one, So the first piece one, the upper the function is one over x. So I use the function, I approximate it by one from one to two. Yeah. And that will give me an area of one. Now over here, I'm using one half from two to three, and that will give me one half. I'm now using one third <coughs> from three to four, and that will give me one third. Mm -hmm. And then I'm using one over n from n to n plus one and that will give me one over n. So because I have n blocks, yes, yeah. I've got a side here. Sorry. Yep, no problem. So for the other one, if I go in this direction, this gives me the lower bound. Here, but what's the lower bound in this region? Not drawn to steel. The upper bound was one, what's a half? What's the lower bound here? A third. So over here, this would be greater than or equal to the integral from one to n of one over x dx. That's the lower bound, but I'm missing the one. <coughs> so I have to add on the one. So the value of this sum is sandwiched between this integral and that integral. All right, well, you know, we haven't integrated at all. You know, there's gonna be at least some integration, right? So what's the integral of one over x? That's all, unfortunately, we did stuff with that. So we have you know, our sum, one plus one half plus one over n is gonna be less than or equal to the natural log of n plus one minus the natural log of one. And over here, <coughs> is going to be one plus the natural log of n. So the natural log of one is zero. So I can write this as the natural log of n times one plus one over n. I'm just writing n plus one in a nice way. <laughs> Why do I want to do this? Because the log of a product is the sum of the logs. Uh, you still think of logs every time you see a product? That's why I should, that's why I should be the first one to graduate from Williams with a staff PhD. So this is going to be the log of n plus the log, sorry, I'm sorry, the log of one plus one over n. And then you could try to expand the log of one plus one over n to get some estimate. Um, oh. I'm actually worried that there's a small algebra mistake here because it almost looks like the lower bound is larger than the upper bound. Mm -hmm. So why did you have to add the one back in? Ah, oh, so I think that I think that's the issue is I can't I can't add the one back in. Yeah, because you wanted it to that, be lower. Right. You were, because I don't have the one. I'm underestimating and I'm missing the one as well. And so I could add the one back, but then I'd have to add a one here and a one there. Mm -hmm. so, I, so I have to do it like this. So there is no one. So it's smaller than this for two reasons. Uh, I'm not adding that first block, and I'm underneath the curve. So I'm losing for two different <coughs> reasons. So the log of n is less than equal to our sum, is less than equal to the log of n plus the log of one plus one over n. Well, we said earlier by Taylor series, the log of one plus one over n is approximately negative, okay, sorry. We said the log of one minus x 
was about negative x. Mm -hmm. So here, our x is negative. negative 1 over n. So when we put it in, that becomes a positive 1 over n. So we get 1 plus a half plus 1 over n. We'll have a log of n here, and we'll have a log of n plus something of size 1 over n. The next term would be 1 over n squared. Plus small. So what this is telling us is that if we want to evaluate this sum, we're not off by much. We're off by 1 over n. That's impressive to be this close. So the sum is really growing at a logarithmic rate. Okay. So I know we've been doing a lot of math, which is, of course, I think what you were expecting. But so, so, so the statistician can't return this into real numbers right here, like a, or the total number. Yeah, ten, yeah, ten dominoes. Right. Let's get an overhead. So if you had 10 dominoes, you could get an overhang of here, the log of 10, which is about 2.3. Yeah. Yeah, 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 you're, yeah. You're over the first or the bottom domino. You're over the bottom, you're completely over the bottom domino. Yeah. Unfortunately, if you want to go even further, what if you want to go three dominoes, four dominoes, five dominoes? Yeah. So a great question to ask the students is, how quickly do you have to go to get each additional domino? And that's what you do. You can do this with a spreadsheet, you can do this as a nice calculation, and you can see that, oh my god, it takes a while to keep gaining those additional dominoes. Because log is a very slowly mm -hmm. growing mm -hmm. function. Yeah. Log, yeah. yeah. Um, the joke is that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. Will so, it actually get there? No. The natural log of uh, e to the 10 is 10. The natural log of e to the 100 is 100. So your, the amount you've moved is very small. And so the function is going off to infinity, but it's going off to infinity at a very slow rate. We have ways to estimate what the value is. OK, so what I thought I would do is end with the egg drop problem. There is some calculus behind this. I am somewhat hoping that we will not finish this before you say it's time to go, so that you have something to think about in the intervening weeks. So. It's important that I'm allowed to make reasonable assumptions for this problem. And I have to also convince you that for some reason, this is a problem worth considering. So this is the infamous egg drop problem. Don't you brought me eggs. I wasn't sure if you could bring things. <laughs> Does anybody have anything really valuable or fragile? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we are going to look at mathematical idealized eggs. Okay, these are terrific eggs. Okay, if you drop the egg from a certain height and it doesn't break, there is no damage done to the egg. You can keep dropping it from that height and it will <coughs> never break. What happens if you drop it from a lower height? It won't break. Right. So if you drop it from a certain height and it doesn't break, no damage is done, and you can drop it from that height or lower and it's fine. What happens if you drop it from a higher height? It might break. It might break. So the goal <coughs> is to, I don't know why, but you have a building, yeah. you know, often it has 100 stories, and you want to figure out what is the highest story you can drop the egg from and not have it break. And you have one egg. So as soon as the egg breaks, it is not usable. You know, Humpty Dumpty, OK? Mm -hmm. What plan should you use to find out where you can drop the egg from without it breaking? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so you don't care if at the end of your analysis the egg is broken. Mm -hmm. 
you know, the emperor or empress is going to come later with his or her special golden egg, and you know, they're six years old and they really want to drop the egg and not see it splatter, but they want to drop it from as high as possible. So it's okay if your egg is destroyed at the end of your analysis. You just want to make sure that when the emperor or empress arrives and wants to know where can I drop my egg, you will tell them the highest floor they can drop it from. So what's the only strategy that you can use if you have just one egg? Um, you gotta start. You gotta go one, two, three. Drop at floor one. If crack, done. Else drop floor two. If crack, done. Else, yep. Drop floor three. Okay. So worst case scenario, worst case scenario, how many drops would be needed? Hundred drops. So I guess it depends on the worst case. I mean, you could say you know you might be enjoying dropping the egg, yeah. <laughs> right. Right. You can also play the game, I think, with fresh ones. <laughs> and so you can see, worst case scenario, what is that going to mean? It's going to mean, how many drops do I need before I find out for certainty what has gone, you know, where I can drop it from safe. Mm -hmm. Do we all agree that this game is boring? Uh -huh. So, like, it's by floors, right? It's not like the specific. Right, right. right. We're, 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 not, we're not doing a continuous thing throughout the program. Hello. How are you? Good. How are you doing? Sorry to interrupt. Real quick. No, please. Oh, please join us. <laughs> uh, do you have anything <laughs> fragile on you, by any chance? Can I fall? No, no, no. Don't give it to him. So, we're doing the famous egg drop problem. Uh, I will quickly recap. We haven't done too much. So, there is an emperor or empress who has a very special golden egg, and they are five or six years old, and they're really looking forward to dropping it off a building and not seeing it shatter. Okay? We're not gonna make this a reasonable game to play or justify why you want to do this. And we want them to be able to drop the egg from the highest floor possible without breaking. So your assignment, or your assignment to delegate, is to okay. find the highest floor that the emperor or empress can drop their egg. All you have is you have one egg, but it's a nice mathematical egg. Ooh. Yeah, these are nice. So if you drop it from a certain height and it doesn't crack, no damage is done to the egg. You can drop it a thousand times from the same place, and if it didn't crack the first time, it won't crack any subsequent time. No damage <coughs> is done. If you drop it from a lower height, no damage is done. If you drop it from a higher height, we don't know. So what you want to do is you want to figure out what is the highest place the emperor or empress can drop the egg and not have it crack. We don't care if your egg is destroyed by the time the emperor or empress arrives. All we need to do is figure out where can they do it. So if you have only one egg and you want to know exactly what floor, unfortunately the strategy is pretty much fixed. You have to start off at floor one and drop it. If it cracks, you're done. If not, go to floor two and drop it. If it cracks, you're done, else go to floor three and drop it. So the worst case scenario, the maximum number of drops, and there was some discussion as what do we mean by worst case, because some people actually enjoyed the idea of throwing <laughs> eggs or watermelons or things off the building. I would watch your staff if I were you. Uh, we said the worst case is going to be the maximum number of drops, because we want to find out as fast as possible and report back to the emperor empress, this is the floor. They have all the patience of a five or six year old magnified by the fact that they have unlimited power and can get whatever they want. So worst case is we have to do 100 drops. There is really nothing else we can do with one egg and 100 floors. So we want to generalize the problem. There are two ways to generalize. One way is easy, one way is hard. What's the first, the easy way to generalize this problem? Two eggs. Two eggs. No, that's the hard way to generalize. <laughs> <laughs> Infinite number of eggs. No. Eggs. No. So one way is to generalize the number of eggs. That's the hard way. There's an easy way to generalize this problem. Number of floors. Number of floors. Right. We could generalize by saying instead of having 100 floors, there are 200 floors. 
the journalization is so easy, you're all skipping it. <laughs> you're 200 like, grams. 200 grams. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This, is, this is not that challenging. Yeah, this is what we gave up our classes for. <laughs> 200 grams. <laughs> I yeah. really wish I knew you were coming at the end and saying we got a lot of stuff for that. So we, we all agree, you know, changing the yeah. rules <laughs> is trivial, right? It's not even worth talking about going through the analysis with 200 floors. So let's change the number of eggs. So the simplest thing is to now imagine our you know, budget was not quite as bad as we thought it was going to be. Oh, that's a much better way to plan it. We now have <laughs> Uh, two eggs, okay? Can somebody give me an upper bound for the worst case scenario of the number of drops? It can be, I want it to be a really bad upper bound for two eggs. The stupidest upper bound you can think of. No, that's not, 100, right? Why is 100 an upper bound with two eggs? Because you can just do it with one egg, right? So whatever strategy I do, it can't be worse than having just one egg. But now I have the advantage of I have two eggs. So I can have one egg dropping a little bit, and then that egg can crack, and then I can shift to my second egg. Mm -hmm. So it all comes down to where do I drop the first egg? So I'll let you think about it um, amongst yourselves. I'll let you talk to each other. This will give me a chance to collect all the dominoes and you know, do my cleanup. And, and each floor has an equal probability. Uh, so, I mean, I mean, I'm being, so, I'm being the so, right so this is where it gets interesting in terms of analyzing for what the worst case scenario is. Mm -hmm. You could say, assume all floors are equally likely to be the floor with egg first breaks. What strategy should you use to minimize the expected value? Mm -hmm. What I will do is instead I will say, let's just look at the worst possibility. We don't know which floor it is, but we'll say whatever strategy you use, the floor will be chosen in such a way that it is the worst one for you if you have two eggs. So we have two eggs. Mm -hmm. So the question is, one of your eggs can now break. Where do you want to drop your first egg? And then if your first if, you, if your first egg cracks, what are you going to do? So you could start with two floors. Right. Well, that's yeah. So so I plug in five from each person oh, just go. One more minute to think. Yeah, but the cost of three of these mathematical <laughs> eggs, I mean, the budget's not unlimited. When you're doing the analysis for problems like this, you know all additions and whatnot are accurate to within one or two. Because yeah, sometimes when you're trying to calculate, you know how many things is this going to cost, you know it's always a question of where do you put your summations. We've had this issue before. Do I start here? Do I start there? You might be off by one or two when you're estimating. It's just your ballpark, roughly how much is it taking. So with one egg, you know, if we had n floors, it took us n drops. With two eggs, how many will it take? And with three eggs, with four eggs. So as a function of the number of eggs, three is going to be different. So, well, yes. 
<laughs> the trigger will be off. But, okay, I think it's just really, like the two, it's, it's so it's just you, you drop the first three, you have more chances. Like it's, I know it's so stupid, but I just know. So stupid would be to drop two eggs at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> just to make sure you get a good measure. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So can somebody give me a strategy for where they should drop the first egg? So yeah, this was the point thing. Okay. So we said you could um, make sure you could do this. You could go every 10 floors. Okay. Ten so what is every 10 floors? Yep. Yeah. So that if you make it all the way to the top, that's 10 drops. And then if you make it to the top, then you have to start at 91. Go up to 99. So okay. worst case is 19. Then? So worst case is 19. Mm -hmm. So by doing it every 10 draw, uh, 10 floors, if it breaks on the first one, then you have to do nine more. Mm -hmm. If it breaks on the second one, you have to do nine more. Nine. You always have to do nine more mm -hmm. in these. And so um, when you get to the very end, maybe you don't drop at the hundredth floor. That might not be the best choice. So if you've done it at the floor 90 and it hasn't cracked yet, it might be good not to go straight to 100. Right. right. So, but so what we're doing right now is we're doing the walk before you run method of mathematics. Okay. So we're not going to have a dynamically changing strategy. What you're saying is I'm always going to do steps of size but, 10. But even if you do go straight to 100, you'd still have to do 19, right? Well, no, but I'm saying, let's, let, let's say you're at 90, you drop it at 90 and it hasn't cracked yet. Yeah. Then maybe you drop the next one at 95. Not at 100. Oh, gotcha. So, yes. okay. what you're doing is you're saying, I'm always going to drop every 10. Maybe it would be better to drop at 14 for the first one, then 13 for the second, then 12, mm -hmm. and kind of balance these. So, th that's a small improvement to this. Okay. Any other strategies? The every 10 floors is 19. Does anybody have another strategy? But wait, you, were we still talking about two eggs? Yes. But you, you can't do it the first at 95. Right, you, you still have one egg left. No, because you dropped you both. You dropped it at 90, it hasn't cracked. Then you would say you would drop it at 100. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Right. Yeah. 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 right. Yeah. You, don't want, you don't want to drop it at 100. Yeah. So, you yeah. Make, so, you, yeah. so you can make it a little bit better. But this is essentially the best answer. This is essentially the best. Does anybody have another strategy? Or was there a strategy you thought of and then discarded? Every other. So every other is a great one. What I like about this problem is when you're doing it with students, there's not just the right answer, there's improvements. Mm -hmm. So the stupid answer is, well, let me just do what I did with one egg, and then just admire this other egg <laughs> and I do things. <laughs> okay. And you can do that and it'll be 100 drops. Okay, can we do better than that? Probably. So the first thing is to do every other. If you do every other, as soon as it breaks, mm -hmm. what's the advantage? Yeah, that's all we have. Yeah. You only have one thing to check. So the advantage of every other is once an egg drops, I, I, you basically know the answer. You're off by at most one. You can adjust and fix trivially. Mm -hmm. What's the disadvantage? You, you might have to drop a lot. So how many drops might you have to do? Yeah, see, this is where I said it's up. It's within yeah. one. It's either 49 or 50. I don't really care. Yeah. Okay, I'll, I'll use polite language. <laughs> you know, it doesn't really matter. It's on the order of 50 and then one more drop. So every other... We'll just say it's approximately 51. Because you could drop it at nine at um, 98, doesn't crack. You drop it at 100, mm -hmm. it doesn't crack. I'm sorry, it cracks. Mm -hmm. That's 50 drops. Then you have to drop it at 99. So it could be 51 drops. Okay. There is another possibility. <laughs> You're being sent to the principal's office. <laughs> they come to her, it's really bad. Wow. <laughs> so there's another strategy that a lot of people look at instead of every other. So you could do every third. Uh, first one you reject was 50. Yeah, the other one is to just drop it at 50. So the best thing about dropping it at 50 is if it doesn't crack, you've eliminated half the data, yeah. which is wonderful. The problem is if it cracks, right. you then you have, have to a go huge study, you have to go one by one. And so if it doesn't crack, so this should also be about 51. Mm -hmm. so worst case, worst case yeah. scenario. So if it doesn't crack, we would then drop it at 75 probably, and this is where we do things a little bit dynamically. We wouldn't drop it at 100, we'd probably drop it at 75. So if it cracks at 50, 
for them, we would do one at a time. So actually, I think the worst case would be 50 meters in depth. Mm -hmm. So I think it's actually one better. Now wait, if it's, if it's, if it's done randomly, like if the egg's gonna drop at a random floor, is that strategy, like have a better well, expected value? Well, then it's different. If, if each floor is random, then you could drop things in different ways to protect yourself. Right. Yes, and then the problem becomes different. Mm -hmm. So what I like about this is these are the two competing cases. Here, I want to eliminate as many floors as possible with a drop. Mm -hmm. So eliminate many floors with a drop. So we're just, you know, we're just talking about what the two differences are between these. So they're pulling you in different ways. Dropping it at 50, if it's a successful drop, it eliminates the maximum number of floors you could expect. Mm -hmm. For this one, every other, once fail, little work remains. And so these are the two competing influences. Mm -hmm. So the question is, how do you determine which is better of the two? So in some sense, we're trying to temporalize between the two. Mm -hmm. And this is why people were saying 10. Maybe 10 is drop in, maybe it's better to do 15, maybe it's better to do 20. Mm -hmm. So the question is, how should you look at the mathematics behind this? <laughs> so what if I gave you a thousand floors? What if I gave you ten thousand floors? But didn't you say ah, so square root? But didn't you say you could change? It doesn't have to be like every certain number of floors. Well, we could do it. Well, right. And so, in fact, it's actually better to do the first one at either thirteen or fourteen, and it comes back to the Gauss sum of one plus two plus three plus four plus five. It's all related to this. So these problems may seem like I'm just rambling, I know, <coughs> but they also somehow are all magically aligned to the same parts of mathematics. Did you bring it back to uh, infinity and stuff? Well, we have infinity. It all comes back to this is equal to m, m plus one over two. What you want to do is you want to solve this equation equals 100. Well, in general, you're not going to be able to solve this for an integer floor. But so if you wanted to try to solve this, you would have, um, you know, using a trick from before, this is basically m plus one half squared is approximately equal to 200. So m is approximately equal to uh, the square root of 200, which is 10 times the square root of two, the square root of two is about 1.4, mm -hmm. is about 14 minus a half. So maybe around 13, 14. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that should be where the first floor is is you actually want to do it like this. And the reason is, as soon as you have it cracked, you have to go floor by floor by floor. Mm -hmm. If you've done a lot of drops and it hasn't cracked, then you've already done a lot of drops. Mm -hmm. This is back like the, the tangent of the arctangent of x is x. If you've done a lot of drops and it hasn't cracked, you've done a lot of drops. So you've already paid a huge price. So you don't want to have to check as many things at the end. So the advantage of doing it dynamically <coughs> is you drop it on floor, say, 13 for the first, 12 for the second, 11, then 10, then 9. Mm -hmm. So if it cracks on the 13th drop, you have 12 more checks. Mm -hmm. 12 more checks. Mm -hmm. If you drop it on floor 13 and it doesn't crack, you drop it 12 more and it, does, and it cracks, how many checks do you have left? You have 11 more checks. Mm -hmm. And now the number of drops, this is one drop to get here. Mm -hmm. This is two drops to yeah, get yeah, here. Yeah, yeah. And so the total is 13 drops. And the total is 13 drops, right? So what you're trying to do is you're trying to make each case equally bad. Mm -hmm. And what you did initially is by going by 10 at every single time, it's, it's easy to code. Mm -hmm. But then at the very end, if it fails, you have to go one by one by one after painfully going through a lot of drops to get there. Mm -hmm. So you want to drop at a higher place in the beginning. If it cracks, mm -hmm. fine. I don't have that many to check. And I haven't done that many to begin with. Mm -hmm. But once I've done a lot of drops, I don't want to have to pay the same price. Mm -hmm. And so it all comes down to you know, this sum which we were doing earlier. Mm -hmm. And you, if you want to, of course, you are welcome to use the quadratic formula to solve for the best m. I'm quite happy to do approximations like this. <laughs> and you, this is one of the big things. Can you approximate and get a ballpark sense? 
we have two competing factors here. Hello. Oh, sorry, for you. <laughs> <laughs> well, not for you. Sorry. I mean, what you want. <laughs> I mean, so we have two competing influences. So let's say we're going to take the simple strategy of dropping every X floors. Okay? And let's analyze. So drop every X floors. And then once cracked, how many drops do you need? Um, X minus one. Good. Need X minus one drops. So what's the maximum number of drops you could have before the first crack? A hundred over X. Right. We could have a hundred over X drops, and then we have x minus 1 drops after this. So we want to find, we want to minimize over x. <laughs> Calculus should occur at some point. <laughs> right? Yeah. So one way to do this is you could try to see, okay, here's a function of x. Mm -hmm. The minus 1 doesn't really matter. Mm -hmm. And I could say, let's let f of x equal 100 over x plus x, f prime of x is going to be negative 100 over x squared plus 1. The critical point, we set it equal to 0. And so we get um, x squared equals 100, where x equals 10. Or you could, of course, just directly stare at this and say, why don't I just plug in 10 and see if that works. But I have a suspicion that it's the square root of 100. If I replaced 100 with some general n for n floors, mm -hmm. the algebra really doesn't look that different. All that happens is rather than removing a zero, I put in a square root sign. Mm -hmm. And now we get to see the dependence on the size of the building. So the dependence on the size of the building is going to be the square root of the number of floors. Mm -hmm. So the number of drops in this is going to basically be n over root n plus root n minus one, so it's gonna be about two root n. So need, worst case scenario, approximately two root n drops. We can do a little bit better. And so you know, there was this improvement, but you know, in the theme for soon going back to Taylor series and we'll prove the Lagrange error term either next time or the third time, you wanna have almost levels of solution. Here's the first order approximation, which is pretty good. And then here's the small refinement. There's a lot of things in life where you can spend billions and billions of dollars to get you know, a little bit more accuracy, but for all practical purposes, the first approximation is good enough. Right now, I'm on a regional school committee and we're in the midst of trying to fully regionalize Williamstown and Lanesboro. When we get to the method of least squares and applications of algebraic calculus, I will give you what we hope will become a new standard in Massachusetts to help towns regionalize how to divide chapter seven to funds. So we have about 3.5 million out of our $20 million budget for the three schools coming from chapter 70 funds. We have to figure out how to divide it. And the formula I have using regression is accurate to within about $10,000. Could I have a more accurate formula? Sure. I've got to be careful because this is being recorded. And I'd love <laughs> the opportunity of going before the voters in the two communities and explaining a formula with 43 parameters and why the values of these parameters are as follows. You know, by using just two parameters, we can get a really good approximation. And you know, given the you know, inherent fluctuations, within $10,000 out of 3.5 billion is close enough. So here, yes, you should drop the first one at 13 and not at 10, but if you're doing 10, that's terrific. So here, you see that we want to um, get to square root of n. Another way to roughly see this is I have two competing factors here. As x goes down, what happens to n over x? It gets bigger. So what that means is the smaller the location of my first drop, the lower the first drop is, the more drops I could potentially have. But then the better I'm going to be on this part. So this part is bad, but this part is now really good. Conversely, if x gets very, very large, I have very few drops to make here. But then I have a lot of time spent. You can see that this is 
exactly these two points here, pulling in extremes. This is the case you know, of every other that's taking the x to be very small. That means we have a lot of drops here, but then it's very fast here. This one, where you make it 50, you have very few drops here, but then a lot of work afterwards. So what we're really trying to do is we're trying to essentially equalize uh, the green I forgot does not work anymore. Um, we're trying to equalize this term and this term. So one way to estimate what the answer is, I've got two competing influences. Let's set them equal. So what's the special x where n over x is as bad as x? That's going to give me n equals x squared, and as you saw, x equals the square root of n. So it is now time to assign homework. <laughs> Who can figure out the homework problem? More yeah. eggs. More eggs, right? Yeah. So this is the question. What would happen if you had three eggs? Where should you make the first drop? Mm -hmm. And then what should you do after you make the first drop? So with two eggs, so I will risk doing something that could be potentially leading. I'm going to make a data table. So number of eggs <laughs> and then drops. So we have one egg, um, so maybe worst case scenario. Yeah, maybe <coughs> number of drops, worst case scenario. Yeah. With one egg, it was n drops. With two eggs. So it's two root n. What might you guess for three x? So my freshman math professor, the one I told you who's now at Microsoft who did the domino problem, he is the only math professor in my career who's ever defined obvious to me. <laughs> so he said, something is obvious, and he could probably get in trouble nowadays for saying this, if I can come into your room at 2 a.m., so professors are not supposed to go into student rooms at 2 a.m., you can attest to the fact that I don't do this. Um, so you can go in, he can go into my room at 2 in the morning, wake me up, ask me the problem, I can solve it immediately and easily, I can go back to sleep and sleep soundly. <laughs> then it's obvious. Otherwise, he wants to prove. <laughs> so, uh, you can get your phone number so I can call you at 3 a.m. <laughs> Otherwise, you know, think about this for next time. And then, is this reasonable? Because 3 is larger than 2. Doesn't that scare you a little bit? Shouldn't we be getting better as we have more eggs? But a cube root is much smaller than the square root. So if n is really, really large, right. n to the one third. So what you can do is you can do in your know, quick calculation, you know, at what point are they equal? So if I want two n to the half to equal three n to the third, uh, this is the same as n to the one sixth mm -hmm. equals three halves. Yeah. So we get n equals three halves to the sixth. Yeah. So once you hit something like that, the two are equal. Once you get beyond that, this will be smaller. So you'll be OK. But you know, it could be the case that for small values of n, maybe you know, things are a little bit tricky. Mm -hmm. But it's, can you guess what you think the functional dependence is? Now, we only have two data points. Mm -hmm. yeah, it could be worse. You know, we could have one data point. <laughs> but do you think it's really going to be 3 into the 1 thing? No. And then are we allowed to drop eggs in this building? Are we, are we allowed to drop eggs, watermelon? And so, do students walk outside those windows? No, not very often. Oh, not very often. Excellent. <laughs> and, and then they can be trained not to walk outside after. Yeah, wonderful, wonderful. We're going to tell them to. Go to the Israel instead. Yeah. I get such things I won't walk out of. <laughs> Which ones go there? Yeah. Excellent. All right, so I think this is a good place to end. You didn't say math, you didn't take a piece of it.